It's 1916. The German plan on the Western Front was to force favourable engagements to wear the French and British down. The fortified city of Verdun was a symbol of French military prestige and its loss would have been a significant psychological blow. The Germans, therefore, initiated an engagement at Verdun designed to draw the French into an attack and suffer heavy casualties. The Battle of the Somme had first been planned as a joint British and French offensive, but became British focused due to French commitments at Verdun. One of the goals of the offensive was to divert German forces to the area and relieve the pressure at Verdun. The British intention was to capture the Montauban, Bozier, Serre Heights and then advance to the Bapom Jinshi area before securing the Arras Bapom Ser area for future operations. The more northern forces of the British army near Gomgor would be a diversionary attack to hold German troops there. The Germans were aware of the upcoming offensive. Observations of British preparations and German intelligence had shown that an attack was to be launched around the Somme area. Information had also been gathered on the date of the attack as well as the size of the army facing them. They, however, believed an attack would be focused from Gomgor to Frigor and did not expect an attack near Montauban. Most of the men in the British army were new recruits in Powell's battalions, formed from volunteers. This proposed a difficult challenge to train the men sufficiently in time for the offensive. The British command would have preferred more time, but there was pressure from the French command to attack as soon as possible. 13 divisions, around 150,000 men, lined up along the front line on the 1st of July 1916. These were their objectives for the day. Around 1.5 million shells had already been fired in the last week, around 2.5 every second on average, with aircraft helping to direct them. At 7.30 a.m. the whistle sounded and the men went over. Near the French line the 30th Division advanced quickly over no man's land. They reached the German trenches to find the barbed wire had been cut by artillery and the soldiers were caught sheltering in their dugouts. Machine gun nests were soon locked up. They waited a while for the creeping barrage to move forward before advancing to the next line of trenches. The 90th Brigade moved off and were screened by the brigades in front of it. Once they moved to attack the village of Montauban, they came under machine gun and artillery fire. The machine gunner dealt some casualties, but was cleared by a British Coast Gun crew. The German shells fell harmlessly in the mud. They arrived at Montauban to find the village deserted. The retreating Germans were gunned down with the help of the Royal Flying Corps, distinguishing friend from foe with the help of reflectors on the British soldiers' backs. A hot lunch was brought forward to the village, but at 1.45pm this morale booster was countered by an artillery barrage resulting in heavy casualties. Nonetheless, the 30th Division would advance to reach all of its objectives by the end of the day and took around 500 Germans prisoner. Next to them, the 18th Division saw similar success. At 7.27, explosions rocked the German lines thanks to bombs delivered via shallow tunnels dug into no man's land. The explosion at Casino Point was larger than expected, resulting in several casualties on the 6th Royal Berkshire Regiment. To try to help with the fear of warfare, Captain Neville of the 8th East Surrey Regiment suggested throwing a football over the trench and gradually kicking it to the German line. At 7.30, the infantry successfully advanced through the German trenches much like their comrades to the right. The fighting was fierce. One machine gun company fired around 19,500 rounds. The 8th East Surrey Battalion fell short of its objective as they had lost all but one of their officers, sadly including Captain Neville, and found it difficult to organise an advance. Heavy casualties were inflicted taking strong points. The 18th Division reached their final objectives by the evening and also withstood an artillery barrage at the end of the day. For the 30th and 18th Divisions, everything had gone to plan. Nonetheless, they had lost over 6,000 men compared to the Germans who had lost over 4,000. 
For reference, two divisions would have around 24,000 men at full strength. It shows just how difficult it was to minimise casualties when on the offensive. The fortifications of Mehmet's and Free Corps were particularly strong. The dugouts had inbuilt electricity and some were two storeys tall. At 6.25am, an artillery bombardment commenced. At 7.15am, gas was released to mislead the enemy into believing an attack would come, so that they would come out of their dugouts, before a quick and intense hurricane bombardment commenced at 7.22am. At 7.26am, smoke was released to screen the infantry's advance. The right flank crossed no man's land with few casualties. The centre suffered greater casualties, getting caught up in uncut wire. The left was exposed to machine gun fire from the direction of Free Corps, and therefore lost many men. As the division advanced, some German positions held on ferociously. To their disappointment, they would also find unexploded British shells littered across the battlefield. By the end of the day, the right flank had advanced the most, the centre had captured Mehmet's, and the left had managed to clear the woods in close quarters combat while under heavy fire from machine guns. They hadn't managed to push to their final objectives, but had made substantial gains nonetheless. At 7.28am, three mines at the Tambor were detonated. The artillery barrage had been relatively thin, with few guns used. They also fired shrapnel rounds rather than high explosive rounds, the latter being more effective on barbed wire. The barrage also moved too quickly, meaning that it didn't help the infantry pass the first line. The left flank of the 21st Division advanced to find the German wire defences cut by artillery and advanced quickly. The 8th Somerset Battalion and the 4th Middlesex Battalion next to them had a much more difficult time and were met with machine gun fire as soon as they left their trenches, forcing them to retreat. They launched another attack with reserve battalions and managed to break through with heavy casualties. The 10th West Yorkshire Battalion to their right had a much greater struggle. Brutally effective machine gun fire gunned down almost 95% of those who went over the top, the highest casualty rate in the British Army throughout the Great War. A second phase of attack had been planned at 10.30am, but this was pushed back to 2.30pm. One company of the 7th Green Howards mistakenly attacked at 7.45am on their own, leading to their almost complete annihilation. At 2pm, an artillery barrage hit the village of Freecourt. The nervously waiting men would later find out that this had done little damage. As the assault began, they were met with an onslaught of machine gun and rifle fire. Over 300 men became casualties in just 3 minutes, meaning that around 3 men fell every 2 seconds on average. The 20th Manchesters managed to establish a small foothold across no man's land, but at the cost of around 550 casualties. This left them with an operational strength of around just 150. At 7.28am, mines exploded on the front line near the village of La Boiselle. Men of the 34th Division launched their attack. The Germans had sheltered in their deep dugouts and then manned their defences when the artillery barrage had lifted. Rifle, machine gun and mortar fire were unleashed on the attackers. Many men huddled in shell holes and waited for nightfall to retreat. Those who managed to break through established a small foothold near the village. Some men of the Tyneside Irish Brigade managed to push through around a mile deep to the next village of Contamaison, but unfortunately none of these men survived. Others joined elements of the neighbouring 21st Division who had managed to break through. As the attackers drew closer to the German trenches, fire gradually became thicker and thicker. When the first wave was around 80 yards away, German machine gun and rifle fire intensified, while simultaneously, artillery started to shell no man's land. With little cover, the men abandoned the plan to advance at a steady walking pace and charged into the trenches. Companies started to overlap and it became a messy crowd of men. For the 11th Sherwood Battalion, much like many others, a large number of them didn't make it very far and lay dead next to the British trench. Those who were wounded had to deal with a lack of water in the hot French summer. One of these men was the commanding officer of the battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Watson, who hid in a shell hole until he was carried to safety by three privates. 
On the right, some isolated detachments advanced past the first line of trenches, but this was stopped by crossfire from their flanks. The men in the centre attacking the village of Ovillier failed to consolidate at the German trench due to the little cover it gave them, and they retreated. The left managed to advance further, however they suffered heavy casualties and were subsequently halted. All of the men of the 8th Division would retreat by the end of the day. Seeing the town ahead of them pulverised into rubble, the commanders of the 32nd Division believed with confidence that resistance would be minimal and subsequently didn't plan for a scenario with a strong defence. One believed that they would catch the Germans in their trenches. The 97th Brigade on the right crept forward more than usual to 30 or 40 yards in front of the German lines. With the wire having been cut, they rushed into the trenches and indeed caught the Germans in their dugouts and took them prisoner. However, other trenches had managed to man themselves before the attackers arrived, and the advancing British troops were cut down and forced to retreat. Though on the surface the buildings of the town were destroyed, they had deep cellars that were protected from the hail of artillery, and it was as if no bombardment took place at all. Airplane observers mistakenly believed that they saw British helmets in the town, and the result was that no artillery bombardments targeted it. Only a small part of the line was captured by the end of the day. The part of the 36th Division in the Tietfal Woods fared much better. At 7.30am they advanced to find little German opposition and moved at a rapid pace. They moved so quickly in fact that they were hit with their own artillery. When they advanced past the first few lines of trenches, heavy machine gun and shell fire opened up. A German counter-attack forced a retreat on elements that had advanced the furthest. A bombardment ensued in preparation for another counter-attack. The counter-attack was repulsed by British machine guns and artillery, and the Germans were halted at the second line. In the late evening there was a period of gradual retirement of the exhausted troops to the first line. Elements of the 36th Division on the other side of the Ancre River also advanced but the wire was not completely destroyed. Machine guns were trained on the gaps between the wires and inflicted heavy casualties on the attackers. Some German soldiers surrendered only to continue fighting when they realised how few men had actually made it through. Only around 80 men and no officers from the 9th Royal Irish Fusilier Battalion returned unwounded. For reference, a battalion usually has around 1,000 men at full strength. Of the 12th Royal Irish Rifle Battalion, the other battalion of the 36th Division in this area, only 100 men could be collected and sent to attack again, along with the division next to them. This failed, and another attack was planned at 12.30pm. At this point, the remnants of this battalion numbered only 46 and it was called off. These battalions suffered horrendous casualties and had effectively been wiped out. The 36th Division, also known as the Ulster Division, suffered around 5,000 casualties in total. A large mine was to be detonated at the strong point of the Hawthorne Redoubt, and the crater would be captured ahead of the main attack as a forward position. Some officers argued that this should be pulled four hours ahead, so that German alarm would have died down. However, headquarters forbade this, justifying that the extra time would probably result in the Germans recapturing the position. As a result, the mine exploded at 7.20am, just 10 minutes before the main attack, and, as the artillery couldn't fire on the men advancing to capture the crater, the heavy guns moved to the next line. When the main attack came at 7.30am, the Germans were ready. Machine gun, rifle and accurate artillery fire inflicted heavy casualties on the British. Uncut wires added to the struggle. As some advanced further, German soldiers would open fire from behind them in uncleared positions. The Newfoundland Battalion, a battalion is usually 1,000 men at full strength, suffered 710 casualties. These difficult conditions meant that the 29th Division failed to establish a foothold in the German trenches. The 4th Division's artillery had completely cut the wire and reduced the 1st German trench into a desolate field of shell holes. Nonetheless, the Germans had managed to survive in their dugouts and bravely manned the remnants of their trenches. Battalions managed to push through the first line. The left and centre were more successful than the right. The division headquarters, who were far behind them, couldn't see what was going on. The signal for a successful breakthrough was three white flares and could easily be confused with the signal for held at wire, which is one white flare. 
HQ could see the 29th Division on their right retreating, and therefore held the next attacking waves until they had more information. The failure of the divisions beside them meant that their flanks were exposed. German troops counterattacked from the sides. Only a tiny section of the German front trench was held by the end of the day. The 29th and 4th Divisions had experienced troops, with the 29th having fought at Gallipoli and the 4th being the remnant of the professional British Expeditionary Force. However, this had not been sufficient to ensure their success. The Germans were well aware and well prepared for their attack and inflicted heavy casualties. This North Country Division advanced to find cut German wires but also faced very heavy artillery fire from the higher ground of the village Ser, which had good observations of the British positions. As the British guns stuck to a creeping barrage, there was little flexibility in asking for directed support. The guns had moved on to the next line and the Germans could even walk out of their trenches to find better firing positions. Some men from the 11th East Lancashire Battalion were seen to have advanced into the village, however they were all taken prisoner. The rest of the division failed to make any significant progress on the German lines and none of it was captured by the end of the day. The final two divisions, the 46th and 56th, were going to attack the heavily fortified village of Gomkor. The head of the British Army, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, made a mistake here. The attack was purely diversionary and designed to elongate the German line, however he chose to attack the strongest part of it rather than the weakest. It was highly likely that many men would die to capture a village that was strategically insignificant. Insufficient labour units meant that the men of the 46th and 56th Division had to fill in, and they were incredibly fatigued before the attack. Most of the 46th Division would not get a good night's sleep in the week before the assault. The conditions were terrible too, with constant rain waterlogging their positions. At 7.20am, smoke was released along the line, and at 7.25am, the men of the 56th Division crept forward into their advanced positions for the assault at 7.30am. The men dashed quickly towards the Germans. Most of the wire had been cut, but some had been repaired and caught up attacking troops. Nonetheless, the advance was quick enough to capture the German line before a significant defence could be mustered. A substantial foothold was formed, but this came under fire from German artillery. This was so intense that they could not bring German prisoners back to the British trench, and instead put them back into their dugouts. Attempts to supply the forward troops with bombs and ammunition were destroyed, and the Germans counterattacked, forcing a retreat. The 137th Brigade on the right flank was disoriented by the thick smoke cloud that was released. When the smoke cleared and they had made it through the mud, they found barbed wire obstructing their advance. The Germans were ready and replied with heavy machine gun and artillery fire. Some attackers stayed in the British trench or lay down in no man's land. A few made it to the German line but without support they were driven back or destroyed. The 139th Brigade on the left did better and managed to establish a foothold across no man's land. The men at the head of the attack were occupied with clearing the dugouts as the men at the rear who would usually do this were held up. Heavy casualties also meant that methods for signalling were no longer operable. Commanders tried to renew the unsuccessful 137th Brigade's attack, however, with the men trained for specific tasks, they did not have the flexibility to do this. The muddy landscape would also make movement and reorganisation slow. Then, one of the commanders of this new assault was wounded. No movement took place and the men were ordered to sit tight. The battalions that had reached the German lines later returned with heavy casualties, and none of the German trench was captured by the end of the day. The end of the first day resulted in the lines changing as shown. The French had reached their objectives with their colonial division significantly exceeding them. There were multiple factors to their success. The French troops had greater training, greater numbers of higher quality heavy artillery and the element of surprise. Casualties were 57,470 for the British, while the Germans lost far fewer. The Germans had only fielded four and a half divisions to defend against the 13 British divisions. The British troops were outstanding in courage and character, but lacked experience. Importantly, when the fighting intensified, it was up to regimental officers to take the initiative. In this, they lagged behind their German counterparts, who were well trained in peacetime. 
Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig believed that there was insufficient justification for a radical change in plan. The objective for the next day was to continue to apply pressure and to try to take the second line of trenches. He particularly wanted to capture Fricourt, which was now surrounded on both flanks. The successful 13th Corps near the French line was ordered to consolidate their gains. 15th Corps was to capture Fricourt and attack Mehmet's Wood with 13th Corps. Third Corps was to repeat its efforts to capture La Boiselle, Ovillier, and then Quant Maison. Tenth Corps would get reinforcements from the 25th Division and was ordered to capture the German front line with Eighth Corps. Seventh Corps at Goncourt would not be asked to continue their deadly diversionary attacks. The first day on the Somme failed to reach most of its objectives and in many places failed to capture any ground. However, it did establish a significant foothold, especially in the French sector, from which future attacks could be launched. The opportunity to fulfil British tactical goals were rapidly fading as German reinforcements flooded in. The next few days would be crucial in determining the outcome of the battle and potentially the war. If you would like more detail about the battle, I would recommend the sources that are used for this video. Brigadier General Sir James Edmund's 1932 book On the Somme is a part of the British Official History series and provides a detailed record of the background and events of the battle. The Wartime Memories Project is an online database with personal stories and military reports from World War I and II. Chris McCarthy's book gives an interesting day-by-day -day account with maps to visualise the soldiers' movement. Links to access these works are in the description.